very good afternoon very good afternoon to everyone thank you for taking your afternoon lunch time to listen to the presentation today uh it's going to be a two-hour session so uh we have a lot more registered but let them trickle in i'm not going to wait uh, let them come in as they come uh please be informed this session is being recorded uh you have been muted so later if you need to uh, ask any question you can do that towards the end or you can continuously uh, put your question in the chat in case you forget what question you want to ask later so let me start by first sharing my screen okay so i hope you can see my screen clearly um okay so the the course or the training that you are registered uh, under HRD Corp under the National Training Week uh, for this session is called Toolkit to Develop Community-Based Tourism. Okay, a snapshot in preparing, developing, and sustaining community-based tourism. So I use the keyword here is snapshot only. Why snapshot? Because there's no way you can learn how to use a toolkit within two hours because a full flash program like this will take you about at least three to four days uh, workshop to actually run the uh, to use this toolkit more effectively so i'm going to give you a snapshot to give you the interest if you think this is something that's really workable for you then you can communicate with me and then we can we can conduct a more in-depth session um, i'm based at district college i'm a professor of sustainable tourism and also the president of uh, district college based in in penang I'm also the president of the uh, Malaysian uh, Ecotourism Association and also the program leader for Responsible Rural Tourism Network. Just to give you a snapshot about myself before I start uh, uh, talking to you about the topic. Um, before joining District College in Penang, uh, I served uh, at Taylor's University of Malaysia for almost 19 years uh, before I left to the Bahamas in 2017. So my field of expertise is in sustainable tourism, responsible tourism, and rural tourism. Hence, uh, I think good research and extension work uh, in tourism is critical in my own scholarly journey. So as you can see uh, from this screenshot, I have been active in uh, various professional bodies in Malaysia, in the Bahamas, uh, in Southeast Asia, and also globally. Hence, I have more than 25 years experience working on various uh, research, uh, outreach and extension projects, especially in trying to introduce tourism to the local community. So I'm happy to be here to share with all of you uh, my experience and thoughts on this uh, brief session today. So my presentation today will be uh, based on my experience working on similar projects when I was in Malaysia uh, with Taylor's University for 19 years, and then I, in 2017, I had an opportunity to do some work uh, close to the Car in the Caribbean area, very close to the US. And uh, what I include here in my session today is very much my learnings in Southeast Asia and also in the Caribbean. So the toolkit that I'm going to introduce you is, is adapted from my 25 years uh, working in, in this uh, area. A snapshot of, of Penang for those of you who have not come to Penang for a while or if you have any participants who are out of Malaysia. Just a quick intro before I start the session uh, of where I'm based. I'm currently based at District College. District College is uh, one of the one of our first uh, private tertiary institution uh, which was set up in 1987. The college have graduated more than 15,000 students in various uh, Pre university diploma and degree program, as you can see uh, in the slide. Currently, the, the college is going through a new management restructuring uh, that will allow us to offer a new program, as, as you can see listed uh, in yellow there. So please do uh, check us out in our website for further details if you need uh, further information about any of our programs. Okay, so let us get back to our session today, our training program today, uh, in trying to introduce a toolkit to develop 
community-based tourism or in short CBT. Okay, so as I've said, this will be a snapshot. So at the end of today's session, uh, at least you get a clear, you will be able to clearly describe the fundamentals of what CBT or community-based tourism is all about. You will be able to use the toolkit uh, in deciding whether tourism could actually work uh, for a particular community and if it is feasible. Okay. Number three, uh, through this session, you will be able to use the toolkit to recommend a step-by-step -step approach, three phases, preparing the community, developing the community, and also sustaining them. And then you will also be able to understand what are the nine steps involved in these three phases. We will also do, uh, I will also introduce you some of the uh, cases where we have actually adopted this uh, toolkit in many countries in the Caribbean and also in Southeast Asia, including in, in Malaysia. So remember, this is just a snapshot and not a full training program. So if you are interested in this uh, toolkit that I'll be introducing to you today, please contact me and I will be able to organize a full flash three to four days uh, workshop on using this toolkit that can actually empower the local community and also to encourage entrepreneurship using CBT program. So the, for the next hour, I will briefly run through to you the outline of uh, what I've just described to you earlier. So before we dive into the discussion about uh, CBT, we need to also understand uh, most CBT programs and activities are in rural destinations. Hence, uh, understanding tourism and rural development is important. In September 2020, uh, the World Tourism Day 2020 was focused with the theme Tourism and Rural Development and how to celebrate the unique role that uh, tourism plays in providing opportunities outside of big cities and preserving cultural and, and natural heritage all around the world. So in conjunction with this uh, World Tourism Day uh, in 2020, uh, I also launched my book, on uh, responsible rural tourism in Asia uh, with case studies coming from Bhutan, China, Japan, Vietnam, India, Philippines, Turkey, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, and also our very own Malaysia. So if you're interested to buy the hard copy or even the ebook, you can get it from Amazon or even uh, directly to the publisher, Channel View Publishing Company. Uh, you just need to Google. If you can't remember the URL that I put on the screen here, just Google. Responsible Rural Tourism in Asia, and you will get the link. So if you're keen, please uh, check out this book. This book basically talks about the best practice, the, the, the positive and the negative, the learnings, what worked, what did not work in some of these countries. So this is a good learning for you if you want, if you're more interested to, to develop your rural tourism product. As I've said before, we, we try to understand uh, why CB, uh, what CBT is all about by baseline, baselining the, terminal, uh, the terminology uh, using rural tourism. Who are considered the rural community? Okay, so we see on the slide here, all population, housing, and territory not included within an urbanized area or urban cluster. Okay, so rural area, or countryside is a geographic area that is located outside the towns and cities. So this will vary from one country to another, how you define uh, rural tourism. If you look at the Malaysia's uh, rural tourism master plan, <coughs> areas with a uh, population that is less than 10,000 people, having agriculture and natural resources <coughs> in which uh, its population, either they're clustered or scattered around, is considered <clears throat> is considered as rural tourism. So rural as uh, area, rural is regarded as area outside urban, including the settlement with population of less than ten thousand people. So sometimes this definition varies from one place to another. So different states, different countries have a different way of defining what you mean by rural. Okay, so rural community can be regarded as Aboriginal indigenous or natives. So it can be 
uh, baseline in different way, in, in differently in different parts of the world. So defining rural tourism uh, may seem obvious as a tourism that takes place in the countryside. But nonetheless, uh, this definition does not include uh, the complexity of the activities and the different forms and meanings uh, developed in different countries. The meaning and the context of, uh, of rural rurality uh, differs from one country to another, very much depending on the economic development phase of the nation. If you look at uh, developed in developed countries, uh, tour rural tourism is has a very positive connotation compared to those developing countries. When you say rural, it means it seems to be uh, tied to a very negative connotation. When you say you are coming from rural, the negative perception that we have is, oh, rural means cheap, rural means outskirt, rural means not safe. You have the negative perception. But in most developed countries, it's quite different. When you say rural, it means countryside. It means clean. People are willing to pay high price to stay in countryside. But if you look at Malaysia, how many of us are willing to pay a, a five-star price to stay in a small kampung to get the nature? So it's, it's quite different. So rural destination requires a primary att attractive tourism product that will attract the visitors to brave the, the hardship to reach the destination, okay? Because it's not easy to go to a rural destination. You may need to spend a few hours just to reach. So there must be something unique to attract people to come to the destination. So in short, rural tourism will give visitor a personalized contact, um, a taste of physical and, and human environment of countryside, and as far as possible, allow them to participate uh, in the activities, the traditional, the culture, lifestyle of the local people. So that is what rural tourism is all about. So in Asia, if you look, uh, rural tourism sector is an important driver for the social and economic growth, especially for developing and low-income countries. So in, this includes even in Malaysia. Then there is another concept that is also important for me to highlight before I show you the the CBT toolkit. This is the concept of responsible tourism. So the concept of responsible rural tourism focuses on tourism operations that are managed in a very sustainable way. Um, it can continue to deliver, it must continue to deliver the benefit for years to come for the community. So typically uh, rural tourism destination have the following uh, characteristic. Uh, located in remote areas, they are small scale, uh, wide open spaces, they are closely associated with, uh, with nature, uh, they are very closely linked with the heritage, they are very much uh, involved in traditional societies and practices. In addition, rural tourism destinations uh, uh, essentially have very distinct uh, characteristics, okay? Low levels of tourism development and opportunities for visitors to directly experience uh, uh, the local economy. So they get to be very close to the local community. So the link between responsible rural tourism and rural tourism is viewed through these three uh, intersecting concepts of responsible development, rural development and tourism development. So when you talk about responsible uh, development, it's a general concept which can be represented in both the rural development and tourism development concept. Whereas rural tourism occurs with a mutual development focus of rural development and tourism development. So hence a responsible rural tourism is able to, to, to support. So in fact, the, when we talk about sustainable development goal SDG, the 17 SDG, it's able to actually support the 17 SDG in preserving the environment and ensuring social equity and economic efficiency. So it's a perfect model if your focus is to develop the 17 SDGs. So now we come to the subset of rural tourism, which is CBT or community-based tourism. CBT is actually uh, the oldest and most sustainable way of conducting tourism with visitors being invited into local and, and non-touristic uh, areas of a community and interacting with the people in these areas to experience the culture, 
um, the food, the music, and participating in their way of life. So is this form of tourism new in Malaysia? Certainly it's not. It has been there for decades and maybe uh, not all, maybe called CBT, but interchangeably, we have used the terminology of homestay, rural tourism, um, agro-tourism. In some countries, it's called the people-to-people -people tourism, like in the Caribbean. But they all target on the same thing, which is making the local community prosper. That's your main goal. So in some countries, CBT is also called something else. Uh, you have uh, uh, CIT, uh, uh, community uh, in tourism, okay? Slightly different model. So, so, but at the end of the day, as I've said, the main goal is to target the community's uh, prosperity. So CBT is uh, one form of tourism uh, that will protect the culture and heritage. CBT is used also as a, a developmental strategy in developing countries. So benefit from CBT can also be a, a combination of economic, uh, social, cultural, and also environmental benefit. External facilitation is needed for good uh, business mentoring. So the community is able to manage their own enterprise effectively. So the capacity building becomes critical. So there are challenges uh, currently, if you see, to get the youth to be involved in this form of tourism, because a lot of the youth uh, at the village is trying to get out of the village and go to the city. So that is a problem. So, so this uh, a model of CBT that is really workable will make ensure that the youth will continue to uh, retain in the village and develop the model. So if you look at in, in 2016, uh, ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nation, actually came out with a, a CBT standard to help nations within Southeast Asia develop their program more effectively by benchmarking the region standards. So there is already some indicators that can help uh, the model. So if you look under this ASEAN framework, 10 principles are adopted to ensure the program are viable uh, environmentally and economically. It's bearable socially and environmentally and also equitable economically and socially. So the 10 principle basically focus on uh, empowering the community. It looks at establishing partnership. It looks at uh, gaining recognized standing. It looks at improving social well-being. It looks at ensuring fair and transparent benefit. Linkages, okay, making sure you have, you can enhance your linkages. It also looks at respecting the local culture, contributing to conservation. Uh, and then it also looks at visitor experience, okay? What kind of visitor experience are you giving? And finally, the most important one, financials have self-sufficiency. So these are critical when you talk about community-based tourism. So when you develop any form of toolkit, it must address what you see here. So this is not just unique to ASEAN, but it is quite standard if you look at any community-based program across the globe. So typically, CBT activities uh, take place in rural tourism setting. So it is quite uh, important first to understand uh, the concept of rurality, which I discussed earlier. So, so in any rural tourism destination, uh, there, are, uh, there are five common uh, dimensions that is critical if CBT is going to succeed. First one, location characteristic, the rural setting. Okay, how many kilometers away is the nearest township? So that is also as important. If you have a, a CBT model smack in the city, yes, you can do, you can man-make something, but is it unique enough? Will people want to come to experience that? So the, the location characteristic is important. Number two, first of visit, why tourists come there in the first place to enjoy the culture and nature. Hence, the type right of the kind of tourists is important because they are coming there to see the culture and nature. If you bring a tourist that do not have any respect or value uh, to, to, to appreciate culture and nature, then that's the wrong type of tourist. So the correct type of tourist is important so that they are able to appreciate the, the rustic nature of rural tourism. Number three, activities types of activities and attraction that you are offering. In a natural setting, 
and activi uh, activities that are associated with culture becomes important. Culture and nature is important. So the activities becomes an important dimension. Sustainability. What is the carrying capacity of the place? Are you able to take a few hundred at, uh, visitors at the same time? So how do you sustain yourself? So the use of sustainable items becomes important. The, the capacity becomes important. At the end of the day, the quality of tourists is more important than the quantity of tourists. And then largely is the scale of operation. So normally, most rural tourism destination, the CBT models are very much small to medium size. Okay, So as I've said, the quality becomes more important than the quantity here. So what is the intention of any tourist visiting rural destination? looking for a, a rural tourism product. So these rural tourists, uh, or sometimes eco-tourists, okay? Most eco-tourists sometimes can also be regarded as rural tourists, not necessarily, but can. They normally look for two main types of attraction in rural destination. The first one, culture and lifestyle. And the second one, physical environment and unique activities. When I say culture and lifestyle, what do they look for? They want a slower pace, simpler lifestyle. You have a model in tourism now called slow tourism, where tourists are able to take their time, not rush. It's not a, a list of, okay, this is a checklist. I need to visit all these places. It's not like that. You just go and take your time and enjoy the culture and lifestyle. So, uh, so normally those who come here, they don't like to go to a destination where there's a lot of tourists. Okay, they like to go to a more secluded destination. So in fact, post-COVID, uh, why CBT and rural tourism is doing much better because tourists are moving away from a uh, crowded destination. So they want to be part of the community because the community there are very friendly. So the, the whole way of life they enjoy. So this is what tourists want to see. So this is one of the uh, important uh, uh, type of attraction. Secondly is, is the environment, the unique the remote location, the environment is still intact. The, the, you find that the smell of the place is so nice because it looks clean and no pollution, no crowdedness, and then the kind of activity that's happening there, unique activity. So all these things will actually attract. So if you have either one of these attraction, then you have a primary product that you can sell, rural tourism. So if you see, all rural tourism products, including community-based tourism, will fail if you do not have these three products working to help one another. So let's look at these three products. Core product. What, is, what do you mean by core primary? You must have a core or, or primary products that makes the CBT uh, unique. Are you able to see my full screen well? One. Yes, we can see. The full screen, huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just wondering. All right. Uh, so if you see the, the first product is the primary product. When you look at the primary product, uh, what makes a particular rural destination unique? Okay. Because if it is not unique, if it's the same as any other village, no tourist want to rough it out to come to see your product. Why should I spend two hours, three hours to reach your destination to see something that I can see elsewhere easily? So, so there are a lot of destiny that's very deep inside, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. I've been to uh, the Penan community in the, in the borders of Kalimantan, okay, Long Lamai village, uh, where you could spend two to three hours just to reach taking the small plane and then walking the jungle, taking their boat a few hours, and then you reach the small village. The same thing, I had a recent experience uh, going to Kota Kinabalu to see uh, into a village to see Rafflesia, the biggest flower in the world. I was so keen to go. But to see Rafflesia, you have to practically trench into the jungle for an hour plus up and down the hill to actually get to enjoy this refresia as a product of rural destination. So you have to have 
a group of tourists who is interested to rough this out. So they will only rough things out if you have this primary product. So this primary product, maybe it's the village, maybe it's the flower. Reflacer is a primary product. People want to see the biggest flower in the world. So it can be wildlife, it can be mountain, uh, it can be a local tribes or culture, it can be a waterfall, unique waterfall, the tallest mountain. So any type of unique attraction and activity is important. That is your primary product. So you must have a primary product. If you don't have a primary product, don't bother selling rural tourism. Number two, ancillary or secondary product. These are the uh, supporting products to support the primary product. This can include restaurants, uh, lodging or accommodation, homestays around uh, souvenir shop, handicraft shops. So this is something to support the tourists who's going there. So not everything can be done in the, in the main destination. Some, yes, uh, there are some successful CBT where they have everything put together. But if you don't, then you need to have this secondary product supporting them. Because if a tourist is going to go deep inside, they need to be comfortable because they are so deep inside this rural destination. Suddenly they need to get access to technology. Can they? Is that an emergency? Can they get a call in? Network? So this basic thing is as important. And then the tertiary product or the augmented. So this include all the support system required to connect these two products. So this is to connect from the, to the outside region, mean to say your road system. Is there a good road to enter? Uh, is there a, an, an, there a small airport nearby? Uh, and then the marketing and promotion done externally to get people in to this place. So all these things is as important. So once you have the core product, the ancillary product and the augmented product all working together, then you will see a successful rural tourism destination. If you just have only one of these, it's not going to work. Okay, so you must have these three things are working. So these three products further, uh, I know the diagram looks so complicated, but actually it is not. Uh, you can summarize what I've said here, the three circles just now, the core product, the ancillary product, and the augmented product by drawing the circle, subsetting one another. The core primary product looks at the micro product that is being promoted by the host, which is the farm, uh, that you're actually going to visit. It is very much at the, at the local farm level. Then the ancillary product are uh, supporting products at the town or at the village level, meaning to say you have accommodation, you've got some shops there, general services to the community, and also it is used by the tourists. And then the third one augmented, the third circle there, the red circle, uh, it looks at the macro product at the state level, meaning linking how the tourists are going to come to your location. So in summary, if you see this diagram, uh, you can see that the core product is the core product is a subset of the ancillary product, which is a subset of the, the bigger circle, the augmented product. So without the core product, the whole rural product will fail. And subsequently, the augmented will fail too. Hence, the success of any uh, community-based tourism product in a rural uh, tourism setting will actually depend on the strength of the three levels of product. So sometimes you may have just one product. What happens is you are able to start developing the home uh, community-based tourism, and then you cannot sustain. Everything else fail. Why? Your road system is bad. Your marketing is bad. Uh, there is no way for, the, uh, for, for, uh, for tourists to reach your destination safely. So all that will actually crumble. Or they come to your place because I spend half a day to reach your place, I need to have a place to stay now. I cannot go back home, but I don't have proper, it fails. That is why these three circles have to work uh, together. All rural tourism products, uh, including CBT, uh, can be sold three ways, okay? If you look here, the, the term that I use here, tourism in the environment, tourism about the environment, and tourism for the environment. Tourism product is in the natural environment. So the first one, if you see, example is adventure tourism. This can include uh, white water rafting, uh, jungle trekking, even uh, climbing mountains, scuba diving. So the tourism product is based, is based on the activities in the environment, in the natural environment. Without the natural environment, the 
the tourism product may not exist. And then you have tourism product is about the natural environment. Example is nature-based tourism or wildlife tourism. So here what is happening is uh, tourists are learning about the environment actually, not tourism, but it's the environment, the flora and fauna, okay? Visiting a zoo, uh, checking out the, the pygmy elephant in the natural surrounding or visiting the orangutan sanctuary in Sandakan. So all those things are, are part of the natural tourism product is about the environment. And then the last one, uh, tourism product is for the natural environment. This is the learning part, okay, ecotourism. Uh, so here tourists are learning or being educated about the environment, the flora and fauna, okay, uh, and the local community that is living the environment. So, so if you look at this, uh, all the three uh, overlaps, uh, can overlap one another uh, and, uh, and how in, in how you classify tourism and their relationship with the, with the natural environment. So rural tourism product or the community-based tourism product can also be, can also fall under these three categories, how you want to sell it. Is it for the focus on the environment, focus on the activity, or focus on the learning? So three ways of doing it. All right, so now if you look at, so that is your fundamentals that I've just uh, briefed you uh, I, on before I dive into the toolkit. So no point I dive into the toolkit if you don't understand what is the fundamental of rural tourism, CBT and responsible tourism. So now let's look at this toolkit. Uh, so this toolkit uh, is uh, originated uh, from the funding that uh, was received under uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC in uh, 20, uh, 2009 where we worked on this project. This project was at that time was led by uh, Professor Amran Hamza of uh, UTM. Uh, the toolkit then was further uh, refined uh, in 2011 to 2016 under the uh, Responsible Rural Tourism uh, Project, which I led. Uh, uh, and then further, this uh, toolkit was refined uh, when I was based in the Caribbean from 2017 to uh, 2021. So although we always say uh, one size does not fit all, meaning to say what you see today, you cannot blindly use it. The steps may be unique from one village to another, but what is important is for you to understand uh, the fundamental, okay? So that you are able to use the same approach in trying to develop CBT. So this, tool, this toolkit was developed based on the best practice from different types of CBT that are led by government, by NGOs, uh, by industry and community. So you can see from this table, uh, the learnings that we adapted from CBT programs, namely in Philippines, South Korea, Vietnam, uh, in China, Malaysia, Canada, Taiwan, New Zealand, and also Australia. So in today's uh, brief session, uh, you, you will get to see this toolkit that we have developed in preparing, developing and sustaining CBT. Uh, this session today uh, will actually enable you to understand how to use this toolkit uh, in your own uh, uh, community uh, to, to increase the yield uh, in the long term. Okay, this toolkit is discussed, will guide you okay, step by step. So uh, with this tight time, I will go through to you quickly the essence of uh, this toolkit. Uh, if you think this is exactly what you need, to develop your community, you can reach out to me. Uh, you can see my email on the screen as well, or you can, uh, and if you want me to run a full-scale uh, workshop uh, for your own area or for your community, I'll be happy to assist. All right, so let's look at the screen first. So if you see this main toolkit, we'll use a nine-step approach in the three phases to prepare the community, to develop the community and also to sustain the community. So as I've said, this is not cast in stone. The steps are not cast in stone. It's very flexible approach to the development of CBT. So uh, the toolkit, uh, there will be a hand-holding session step-by-step. Step. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Prof. Yes. Um, I'm looking at the even full screen. I don't see the step one uh, on the screen. So I'm not sure whether you the rest are able to see, because the step one is actually cut. Uh, 
Okay, my screen is a full screen actually. Hmm. Everyone having the same problem? Okay, we can use. So maybe it's me. All right, it's okay. You can see? Uh, no, I can, but the rest, I think they are saying they can see, but it, I can't see the okay. step one, even if it's a full screen. It's okay. So, okay. All right. It's a full screen, actually, uh, right. okay. where it basically shows the nine steps, step one to step nine. Step one and step two uh, is assessing community needs and readiness for tourism and educate, step two, educate and prepare the community for, for tourism. I will go through one by one if you can't see the screen. Uh, as I've said, uh, these three steps, these three phases actually is a workshop by itself. Okay, so if uh, the workshop that normally I run, if participant is able to complete the three levels, uh, they will get a certificate of achievement. And for those who don't finish, they will just get a certificate of attendance based on the phases that they actually complete. All right. So, uh, so if you look at the screen further. Uh, it gives you the outcome at the, the three phases. The first phase uh, is basically to give the exposure and educate and also to prepare the community on what tourism is all about. Tourism is not for everybody. It doesn't mean that if you bring tourism to a community, they're going to succeed. No. Okay. It is very much an alternate income. So you need to decide first, is tourism for you? So that is the first part of the, uh, the, the phase of the toolkit where it looks at the, the level of community's readiness to get into tourism. And then the second phase uh, is developing the, the product, okay? So this is where you start organizing the community, you try to look at who is the local champion there, and then how they are working together. So that becomes your second stage. And then the third stage is where a lot of CBT models fail. They do not know how to sustain. There is no business plan, nothing, and they just work from day to day uh, operation. There is no benchmarking. There is no partnership. They don't work with anybody. There is no uh, maintenance uh, culture. Uh, there is no checking to see is there something wrong? Is the tourist happy? So those things are missed out, and hence there is no sustainability of a CBT product. So if you see here further this diagram. Uh, this is how the toolkit, uh, the actual complete toolkit will look like. It gives you the steps. It will give you the detailed action plan for every step. Give you some story box to tell, to give you uh, the learning from other case studies from different parts of the world, how they have adopted the particular step. And there'll be a lot of worksheets and related links to improve further. We'll give you a checklist at the end of the tool, toolkit on, uh, on how to manage your uh, CBT model. So let's look at the first First phase, preparing the community. Okay, so preparing the community, as I've said, is important. I'm very sure for those of you uh, uh, coming from developmental background, okay, uh, you will always know that the most important when you roll out any program, capacity more program, especially, uh, the preparation of the community becomes important. You want to get their input. So, what is important here is at step number one here is uh, there are a few important actions that you have to always think through. First one, asking the right question. You're meeting the community for the first time. Okay, you want to develop rural tourism. You want to develop community-based tourism. You want to get um, the buy-in from the local community. So, why should the community be involved? So asking the right question, why should the community be involved in tourism? Uh, so you can ask some key question uh, before the community can actually embrace tourism. Uh, new environment that communities may not be familiar, they may or may not know about tourism. Okay, there's good thing about tourism, there's also bad thing about tourism. Do they know both? Is it going to change their lifestyle? Why should tourism be the agent of change for them? Why can't they do something else? Why can't they go into agriculture? Why tourism? So all this is important. Communities, uh, a naive view of tourism uh, is sometimes influenced by the government. Okay, the government may have certain goals and they blindly go in. So you have to be clear. What is the role of the government? We give you a guide. So is it really what they want? Sometimes they're influenced by the media. 
influenced by NGOs who has a different uh, intention. So high expectation is always a uh, result in uh, uh, the, the local community getting disappointed at the end because they say, oh, I went into tourism and no tourists came to my place and hence I'm not doing well. So they have very high expectation. So you have to manage that expectation. What is a community's uh, current source of livelihood? Because as I've said, tourism is just an alternate income. They in source of income, agriculture, fishing, okay, they're doing uh, uh, some work at, in, in the forest side or whatever. So what is their current socioeconomic condition, the level of employment, the, um, the average income, the, the poverty level, okay, incidence of poverty, are they below the threshold of poverty? Uh, what are the long-term prospects of the current uh, source of livelihood? Are they happy? Okay, with their current condition. So, but the end of the day is, do they want to change? Okay, if yes, then why then should they, uh, why then should tourism be that agent of change? Okay, so these are questions that is important. Number two, determining the role of tourism. If yes, they want to go into tourism, what will be the role of tourism for this community? Tourism is not a, a solution for all economic problem of the community, okay? That has to be clear. So that there, there must be a careful planning and uh, systematic implementation are necessary for it to bring the desired uh, uh, impact to the community. So the role of tourism is going to be very different, okay? Based on the community. It can be uh, an alternate, uh, an alternative livelihood, okay? Certainly so you bring other source of income, Okay, suddenly the, let's say if the woman is not working, the man is uh, in the main economic sector, the women and the youth are free, it can be an alternate income. You can see that a lot in, in, uh, in uh, Vietnam, in Cambodia and Laos, the women and the youth are very much involved in uh, community-based tourism. You see that uh, even in, in some developed countries like in New Zealand, okay, uh, where the, the tourism product has become a, an alternative livelihood for the fishing industry. You look at the whale watch in, in Kaikoura, New Zealand, uh, where the focus is actually whale and fishing. But now coming to watch the whale has become the main tourist attraction more than the fishing industry. So you have to know what is the role of tourism. Tourism can also be to, uh, can play a role to justify conservation work, okay? Because of tourism, I'm protecting the nature, I'm protecting the culture. If no tourists interested, the whole nature and culture is going to be wiped out. If you look at an example in, in Indonesia, okay, those who have been, the, the Angklung village, uh, the, the song, they call it the song Angklung Ujo, uh, where they, they, they actually uh, introduce tourists on the, the bamboo musical instrument. Because of the interest of the tourists, that culture of producing this unclung have grown and people have understood about this musical instrument or else this musical instrument will go extinct. So it's part of conservation. So conservation doesn't mean it has to be nature only. It can also be uh, on something else. It can be on food. It can be on music. Third one, uh, training ground for future participants in other uh, economic uh, sector. So if you look uh, the role of tourism is also one way of training the community, uh, building their capacity. Because of tourism, they suddenly learn how about entrepreneurship. Because of tourism, they need to learn about technology, how to design a website so people can come. So they are learning different skills because managing tourism, but that skill is helping them to be involved in other sectors as well. So that is becoming very critical for those staying at remote locations. So this is one way of also educating the, the youth, the, the local women, so that they, they get the skills required to manage and operate a successful CBT. Okay, the third one is carrying out uh, analysis, situational uh, analysis. Situational analysis of the community's uh, attitude uh, what is their concern? 
what is your goal or aspiration. So these are important because you need to know hey, what is your long-term goal. So normally when you speak to the village headman or the Ketua Kampong, they will be able to tell you, okay, what is the problem with my village? The challenges they're facing. What is their future? What are the concerns they have? These are important discussions that you have to do. What does the community uh, expect to gain from CBT? Is it monetary benefit, the job or income? Or is it non-monetary benefit like uh, making sure there's social cohesion uh, among the community? They're very pride of their local culture. So there are a lot of non-monetary gains as well that can be forged. It can be friendship. It can be building linkages. They want the whole world to know about their culture. So it can be that reason as well. So determining the community's value, uh, attitude becomes important, okay? Talking to the, by talking to the elders, by understanding the whole community's uh, need. So this has become an important part of you doing out a situational analysis. By doing a situation analysis, you will also know uh, what are the labor force needs for tourism. Okay. Do they have the skill to run to the, if, if they have the skill, what skill they have, what skill they are lacking, and what kind of training or capacity building that you need to do to bring them up to the path so that they are able to run their CBT. So this understanding and knowledge about uh, the product they have, the local flora and fauna, what is unique that they have. So this become very important as well. So if you do not understand your own Believe your own product, then you're not able to sell this. So the deep understanding and knowledge about the product becomes as important. So these are the three actions that is critical in step number one. Okay, step number two as part of the toolkit. So once a community decided after going to step one, they say, okay, yes, tourism is is my savior. I want to be part of, I want to uh, uh, be, uh, I want to involve in tourism. So once they have agreed, they've already prepared. So now the community have decided to embrace tourism, educating and preparing the community now has become crucial. Now they say, yes, they want, okay, what do I do next? Okay. So while it's a fact that most uh, rural communities are by nature uh, hospitable, okay, natural, most uh, communities, if you see, Tourism as a business may have bigger challenge. Okay, so the lack of understanding on the business and the impact of tourism can sometimes lead to a destruction of the community. Okay, jealousy happening and unhealthy business rivalry happening among the community. You have seen that, seen that in a lot of the homestays in community with tourism, even in, in, in state like Slango, where once it has developed, there is a rivalry happening within the community. So this become another problem. So local communities should be well informed and educated about the many uh, many facets of tourism uh, pre-development. So the education process should take a longer time for relatively a, a remote society compared to those who are closer to the urban. Those who are outskirts, maybe the level of teaching will take much longer. So again here, there are three actions. Uh, in order for you to prepare, educate, and prepare the community. First one, conduct a preliminary assessment. Okay, what do you mean by preliminary assessment? What do you have to offer? Because you remember, you're looking at readiness. What, remember, we talked about your primary tourism products, core, tertiary, so all the three things. What are your, so you do your own inventory. Find out what do you have. What is supporting you have? What are the linkages that you have? So linkages with the surrounding tourism activities. Uh, so based on that, you need to identify your training needs. Then you realize, okay, I need training. Based on my capacity that I have, I'm lacking in what knowledge. And then you identify your training needs. So that forms your first part of your step two, which is coming up with a preliminary assessment on how ready is this particular village to move into CBT. And then second one, uh, trips. Okay, so this is something as important. Have study trips uh, to expose the community. These study trips is not to fly them overseas or what. Sometimes it's good to have what we call a 
a community to community training. Bring a community to visit another community. Rather than making them attend workshops after workshop, a lot of theoretical classes, and then you have breakout session, sometimes it's not as effective. Yes, you can do that, but it's as important to actually have them visit another community and how they have managed. When they look at another community, they become uh, more confident. Oh, if this community can do it, I have similar product. If they have got together and they worked it well, then I have a confidence to do well. So it's always good to expose community to another community. So there's one way of uh, giving the confidence for the community to, uh, to work on their own uh, product. And then, of course, the last one there is a training manual. You must formulate a training manual because whatever you do in a community is not a one-off thing. You want to continue to develop and improve. You did something, it didn't work well, I'm improving. Start working on a manual so that the youth gets trained, the senior citizen, after a while, they are off, and then the youth comes in place. Because if you go to most villages, who is running who is interested in, in rural tourism and CBD? These are the senior citizens. They're very old and yet they're so proud of their culture. But a lot of the information is getting lost because it is not documented. So training manual is one way of training the people and preparing a proper manual on how to operate their CBT model. So that is the first two steps for the first phase, preparing. Second phase is Developing. So now that you're prepared, they know what is tourism about, they're ready, okay, they've got the knowledge. Okay, now I'm going to the second phase, which is trying to develop their actual product. So in order to develop, one of the most important things that we have to do is look for a leader, a local champion. For those of you who have worked on similar projects, uh, programs in rural design, you will always realize that if you do not have a local champion that has the respect of the community, it's so difficult for you to push your agenda. Okay, So you, you must have a local champion who have these positive qualities, it's able to uh, galvanize and, and transform all the community together. Okay, They may be risk takers, but they are smart enough to think for their community. So local champions normally, as I always say, local champion breeds local champion. When we have one good local champion, he will actually replicate these thoughts to the other in the community. Okay, so there are a lot of local champions uh, across the globe, uh, in Malaysia, in, in some of the rural destinations as well, that has uh, allowed rural destinations to be developed. Step number four under the second phase here is... Uh, to prepare and develop the community's organization. How do you organize the whole community? Now that I got a local champion, how to get everyone to work together? So the leader or the local champion should now try to attempt to establish what we call a community organization. He cannot work alone. He needs a community that is capable of planning, operating, and also uh, promoting community-based tourism project. Because at the end of the day, what is important is the buy-in. From the community. If there is no buy-in, you can run whatever training you want and no one is going to come because there's no buy-in in the first place. You just put a training, hey, please come, please come. No one is going to come. So the community organization should include every section of the community, the women, the youth, the senior citizen, the men, all of them should be involved. Of course, most of the men, when you talk about tourism, they may be more involved in their main economic activity, agriculture, farming, fishing. But the women, the youth, senior citizen, yes, they may be a bit more interested at the more time. There's not less pressure on them to go into tourism because it's an alternate income. It's not a main income. So if you look at the any tourism development, we always draw this diagram, okay? This particular curve here, if you see. Uh, there are a few stages that you see on the screen. Uh, rejuvenation or decline versus number of tourists. So you have to, first of all, decide your, if let's say you are, you are already offering tourism product, a community-based tourism product, where are you on this chart? Are you at the beginning stage, exploration? Or you have reached a point where, wow, I used to get a lot of tourists, but now no more tourists. You're already at the declining stage. So where are you in this stage? So the stage one is normally the, the first level is you're trying to develop something new. And stage two is where 
either you can sustain or you can go down. Okay, so stage one uh, community organization is at the initial phase of CBT. So it's drawing solely from the talent within the local community. So you're not having outside input, you're just trying to do everything by yourself without getting any help. So yeah, it's going up for a while, okay? But as you reach stage two, the CBT project has already matured now. Then you need some professional help without sacrificing the community structure. What I mean is, when I say professional help, it doesn't mean that someone from outside coming and taking over the village and the local has no say. That is not what I mean. What I mean is, you've got outside help to help the local people to grow further. You see, in many countries in in Indochina, in Vietnam, in Laos, uh, Cambodia, you see a lot of foreign uh, uh, funders coming in with a different agenda. They develop everything until the fund is there. The moment the fund runs out, they leave. When they leave, the community just goes down. Why? They have not been developed correctly. So it's very selfish way of developing in some of the projects that I've seen in some of these countries. So the role of uh, CBT organization becomes important because as I've said, every person in the community has a role to play. You empower the women and youth, you empower the, the senior citizen, you come up, you formulate a, a common vision, okay, with a with good target put in place. When you set up this organization, you try to nurture the, the whole concept of anti handout mentality. What do you mean by anti handout? It's not just waiting for government subsidy to do everything. You have to do it on your own. So if you're over-relying on funding grants to, to work out your model, then you will fail. So uh, you, you need to start establishing a community uh, fund, a cooperative model okay, where you are sustaining yourself, not just waiting for fund. So once you have this kind of model, then you can start tracking how much you have earned before and how much you're earning now as you go through this model. So everyone benefits, everyone has a share in the community. So that becomes a, a way to actually develop the whole organization of your CBT more successfully. Formulation of a master plan and action plan. So this is as important, your step number five, door. as you start planning and designing the quality product, the community decides on the various uh, action that is required to create uh, a distinct uh, tourism experience. So this is where you start doing the detailed inventory of the tourism resources within the area of village along the, and also along the corridors leading towards the attraction. Because sometimes in order to reach your main destination, there may be other tourism products along the way. How do you tie that with your product? So you start doing a detailed inventory, how a tourist will reach, your destination, what do they see along the way? So product inventory metrics, or sometimes you call it a, a product competitiveness index can be developed. So appropriate techniques uh, can be used to actually come out. So this is itself, as I've said, in a, in a full workshop, you run through this. How do you come up with the inventory metrics? How do you come up with this uh, competitiveness? So appropriate techniques can be used uh, to assist, to evaluate what product is at what stage how good is this product or is it coming down or is it need to be improved? So the aim of the inventory is to evaluate uh, the quality, okay, the quality of the resources that you have and also to look at some iconic active attraction and activities that could be developed in this core tourism product. So when I say core, it doesn't mean just one. Sometimes when you say core tourism product, can have a few things working together and becoming unique. So by the same token, uh, resources and attraction with moderate appeal will only be developed as supporting. So you have something unique as a core, but the supporting one will also be there to give you the whole picture for anyone visiting a, a site. So you need to start identifying. So under the step five, you'll start identifying attraction and activities. Okay, look at the uniqueness, look at the accessibility, uh, facilities that, is, that you have, uh, look at the interpret, interpretation facilities. Is there someone who can speak, who can do the guiding? Uh, language, if you're attracting foreign tourists, what is the language you've spoken? Is there someone who can speak English? Is there someone who can speak Mandarin? So depending on the kind of tourists coming. Accommodation, where can they stay? The lodging, is it homestay? Or do they stay in a hotel nearby? Uh, how do you maintain 
your site is there do you are you able to maintain your your unique uh, product that you have the quality of service that you provide when tourists arrive what do you do the marketing the promotion all those things comes under this uh, plan design of quality product so at the end of the day uh, your aim is to come up with the with the action plan or master plan uh, that looks at your product your product and looks at your your management of your destination uh, in terms of adequate you are ad, you have adequate uh, adequate infrastructure you your product is authentic your product is uh, educational is your product uh, entertaining is it enjoyable is it memorable so these are important things that you want to think about when you talk about your product okay then the interpretation and communication as i've said is as important if tourists come there but not able to communicate with anybody then you, you you fail again so you need to look at how the interpretation done how are they communicated okay and then the service quality as i've said earlier is the service quality provided well so these are important uh uh, indicators that you can use to actually look at this step number five here. All right, so now we come to the last phase, uh, sustaining. Okay, this is another phase that is important uh, where a lot of community actually uh, fail at this stage. They develop the product, everything is good, and then they just go offer to the tourists. And then after a while, they realize that, okay, I'm not doing well, it's coming down, 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 down until it disappears. Okay, so sustaining become as important. As I've said at the beginning, you cannot work in silo. Even as a community, you need to still start engaging with people around you. So step number one, partnership. You have to develop partnership depending on where you are. Partnership with the government agencies or government link agencies partnership with uh, NGOs, uh, academic institutions, universities and colleges and schools, how can they be involved? Uh, how do you tie with the local tourism industry? All these become as important because without partnership, you cannot sustain yourself. You need to have some form of partnership. If you look at NGOs, uh, normally you're able to increase the capacity in undertaking conservation projects. A lot of NGOs support conservation projects. Whereas the academic institution, universities and colleges, they tend to educate the local community on the appropriate framework to use, the tools to use. Uh, just like what I'm doing now, I'm based in an institution. We develop all these tools to help the community. So you need to be engaging uh, uh, with the community and the community should be able to be engaged with us as well. And then, of course, you have the government agencies and government link agency. Where, uh, the, how do you empower them? What sort of subsidy given? But this subsidy cannot be seen as a subsidy trap where they are not developing themselves. So as long as the subsidy is helping them to grow, then it's good. Okay, It's not just uh, giving them the money, but there's not much empowerment given to them. So then it fails. Tourism industry, uh, this is important uh, on the marketing and promotion, especially when you have something unique. So uh, as you want some unique tourists to come. Not every tourist is going to enjoy community-based tourism. Step seven, okay, we have three more steps. Integration with conservation, sustainable development, and uh, responsible tourism projects. So CBT, is able to, uh, to adopt an integrated approach. CBT project normally results in spin-off in, uh, in the form of conservation projects, which will provide employment because your, your main job was to, you went into tourism because you want to conserve something. But when more and more tourists come in, you want to spend more time doing conservation, that will result in employment, okay? As well as contribute uh, to the well-being of the whole community. So many of the NGOs are initiated CBT projects. Uh, if you look across Southeast Asia, especially, they are mainly focused on conservation or sustainable development projects in which uh, tourism is actually used to compensate for the loss of potential income, okay, by not cutting down your logs, your trees, or not selling, not selling your timber. So they use tourism to, hey, tourism is actually substituting that. So please don't cut down your trees. Don't 
uh, uh, clear the forest. Okay, but we'll only provide because by doing that, it will provide a very short to medium term employment opportunity. So you need to find ways to make sure that uh, any employment that you are trying to design uh, are more long term. Integration with uh, with other economic sector. So another dimension of the community based tourism is uh, that CBT is seldom highlighted uh, in, the, in the sense that when you develop a community, the tendency is you forget about tourism, but you look at what are the skills, as I've said, skills that you've learned across because of tourism that can help you to do well in the other economic uh, sector. So tourism is actually, this, is actually a good training ground for the local community to learn and business skills, okay? Uh, such as managing and operation, financial management, marketing and promotion technique, and now you have digital marketing coming and how they can help the community. So these skills are, uh, are important for the local community to learn uh, so that they are able to undertake uh, uh, or prepare for non-tourism projects that also require a good organization, uh, sound understanding of business, and also our interpersonal skills. So these are as important. So the the learnings you get from tourism allow you to manage other economic sector much more better. Step number eight is marketing. Okay, without visitors coming to your place, without tourists coming to your place, then the whole model will also fail. So again, here uh, uh, it's not rocket scientists that you see here. You are just you just need to make sure your cooperation is there so that you are able to. Uh, look at the six action that I put here, matching the product with potential marketing segment. Okay, who will be interested in your product? Is it a family-oriented tourist? Is it hardcore eco-tourist because it's so difficult to get your place because a lot of uh, trekking and walking and and roughing it out. So what kind of tourist? So you need to be able to match the product with the segment of market. And once you do that, then you know who are your distributors, who are the agents you need to work with. Okay. So the channel of distribution, where do you get these people? Are they foreigners? Are they locals? Are they coming to a village to learn something? Some homestays are known to attract uh, 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 Korean kids and Japanese kids to spend time in the village. Why? They want to learn English. They want to learn English. They stay in a village environment and then they bring English to teach in that environment. So that's another way of, of also approaching. So you want to embrace ICT as a promotional tool. Now with digital marketing, uh, you can do wonders. So how do you bring this small village to the world? In social media, how can the whole world know about this village? So how can you ride on the digital technology? Piggyback riding on two operators and ground handlers. They're already there. You don't have to reinvent. You just, they need a product to sell. So as long as you come up with good terms with them, then you're able to work closely with them. Or maybe you're big enough, you're strong enough, set up your own set up your own travel agency, which is going to be another employment for the local community, the local youths. Leveraging on awards, certificates to shape the branding. So once you are doing well, you start participating in this award. It's not because you want to win the award, but it is a good way of promoting yourself, right? From trip advisors to responsible tourism award. You see, if you look at the village in, um, in, uh, in Sabah, okay? Miso Wildlife. In Kinabatangan, they have won the award, UNWT award for the 21st century uh, village. So one of the top award is like, uh, uh, you can say one of the top award uh, for, for the tourism. And this village in, in, in Sabah, where they are, the main, the main uh, uniqueness of this village is actually their wildlife. So they use the wildlife as the USP, the primary product, and then they develop around that. And they have won Numerous award. All right, the last one, the last stage is monitoring. Okay. If you do everything well, there is no maintenance culture, there's no monitoring whether you're doing well or not, then you will fail. Okay. So this is as important, not just in rural destination, in any destination. Okay. Construct tourist, construct tourist facilities. Uh, if you want them, if you want the the, the local community to be responsible, first of all, involve them. 
then they will maintain it. If you don't involve them, let's say the government come and build something for them, it's not going to develop. It's not going to be sustained. But if they are very much involved in the implementation stage, then you will see them uh, maintaining and monitoring the, the use of it. So regular monitoring performance is important. You need to measure to manage. If you cannot measure, there's no indicator to measure how to manage. So you need to know what you want to measure, okay, is it the, so there can be different kind of indicators. It can be effect of tourism on community. It can be local community participation, uh, product quality. You can measure on the benefit across the community, the capacity, how many of them now uh, have learned certain skill and they've gone to a different level of development. Operational and support for the community, the, the environmental manage. So there's so many ways you can actually manage. It may differ from one place to another. You can measure on the tourists coming, measure on the community, manage on the operators that is working, measure even the government. Okay, there must be a way to measure, okay, what sort of support I get from the government or, or, or government link company and, and then how that has benefited. Is it really benefited or not? Or is it just one-sided? So you have to manage it and then see where you are. And then you've got to start having a measurement system that say whether your product is in danger or is in caution stage or is it in a very good healthy stage? And then you do your intervention running capacity, training them, and you do all the quality management uh, system in place so that enforcement takes place and making sure everything is okay. So that is the nine steps. So these nine steps that I've showed you under the, the toolkit can also be supported uh, by looking at few other sets of uh, tools that we have put inside these nine indicators. These are some of the tools that was expanded when I was based in the, in the Caribbean. So through this uh, program, uh, through a combination of many uh, Caribbean countries, they form what we call this Compete Caribbean project, uh, where these nine steps of CBT toolkit was further supported with more. Uh, so these tools were developed to promote business improvement and enhance business profitability. So the toolkit provides, uh, you see here on the diagram, five tools that is required. Okay, right from under the community tourism development, there's two tools there. Enterprise development, there's one tool. Product development, there's one tool. And market development, there's another tool. So these tools uh, are developed to help further on the nine steps that I showed you uh, earlier. So, so if you look at here, under this community tourism development, there is two tools here. How to do tourism asset inventory and also the CBT diagnostic tool. For the tourism asset inventory, uh, an Excel template uh, is actually prepared uh, on to, to look at the, the assets found in the village, which I mentioned to you earlier, which is valuable for CBT development, which can include your attraction, your activities, your, your lodging and accommodation, and all the other services, the expertise available. When I say expertise, do, they have, do you have someone, let's say a local, uh, who is an expert on birds or an expert on, on your herbs in the village. So there are expertise available with the local knowledge. So infrastructure available. So, so remember, we talked about the three products, the primary, secondary, and tertiary product. So this inventory can give you, give you an idea of what to be used, what can be improved, and what need to be removed okay, in a community to, to generate more revenues for the visitors. And then you have the second one, the CBT diagnostic. So for the CBT diagnostic, uh, a frame of reference to assess uh, market readiness and gaps uh, uh, can be included. So you can actually talk about uh, um, the, what we have. We have about seven dimensions normally when you talk about uh, uh, assess uh, community tourism development. The first one, you look at, uh, the leadership I talked to you about earlier, the governance and leadership. How is the community governed together? So that is as important when you talk about diagnostic. Second, community participation. How do you get the community to participate in your event? Okay, what is the role of the leadership in making sure there's uh, community participation? So that is important. Number three, uh, access to resources. What kind of resources does the community have? So this is important when you do a diagnostic as well. Do they have access to funding? Do they have access to loan? 
Are they able to set up a cooperative? So what sort of access to expert and resources do they have? The, the fourth one, infrastructure and services. What sort of infrastructure that you have that is, in, that is needed? Fifth one, human resources, the people. Do they have the people to run the CBT or not? Or we say, hey, 90% of the community are senior citizens. Okay, 10% gone. The youth all disappeared. So then you're going to fail. Assets. The next one, tourism asset. Okay, what is the quality of your tourism asset? You do a diagnosis. And then product development and marketing. Okay, how do you develop your product? Uh, is it yes, uh, you want to attract a tourist to come and stay in a homestay? But is the homestay uh, remain unique? Okay, but at the same time, is friendly enough for a tourist to stay. We're not saying that if a tourist coming to homestay, the homestay must be renovated and look modern. No, remain rustic, but it must be clean enough, safe enough. So that is what we mean. So look at your product and see how it works out. So this, the market readiness can be assessed for, for this uh, seven dimension. Okay, so, uh, so this is important when you talk about uh, uh, how you bring, how do you develop the community uh, using these tools that we have, okay? This, the one here is the enterprise development. And is a, a, we actually, we come up with a, uh, a guidebook, okay, to help this potential small uh, CBT entrepreneurs to be profitable, okay? So this guidebook will actually give you almost a lot of things that what I've discussed today, understanding the global market, understanding what is CBT. So there is a guidebook that gives them the detail. So enterprise development basically is like a guidebook we give a community. Okay, this is a guide to help you. And then we'll run through step by step uh, on the product, on financial management, on marketing, how to build your linkages. Everything that I discovered to uh, discuss today can be part of the handbook. Part one product development and benchmark. So this is the case studies. We look at the learnings. I told, talked to you about community community earlier. What is the learning that you get from other community? You look at some of the best practice. How much are they charging? How much are tourists willing to pay? All this kind of information is needed. When you're selling a product, how to sell this? How much a tourist is willing to spend to come to, to the village? Remember, I talked to you about uh, developed countries and developing countries. In a developing country, people don't want to pay so much to go to a remote location. But in a developed country, yes, they pay to enjoy the countryside. So what is the willingness to pay? So that is, again, become an important benchmark. And then the last one, market development. Okay, Profiling your product versus all the other products in your region. Because I've said, if you want to be unique, you cannot be having the same product, the next release, same product, the next release, same product. How do you sell yourself? So what is unique to you? So that is important to determine your USP or else you are not able to sell. So again, whatever I listed here itself is a workshop where we run through the detail of how do you do the five things that you see here. Okay, so uh, before I just wrap up, I will just quickly glimpse through, I know, we are almost two o'clock. Uh, I'll glimpse through to you snapshot of some of the uh, initiatives that have adapted in different parts of the world. I'm not going to spend time here, but it's all of photograph to show you uh, some of the work that we've done in Myanmar, in Malaysia, in, in the Philippines, and also in, in the Bahamas. This is the uh, village in, uh, in in Sarawak, okay, the long Lamai village that I mentioned to you earlier, deep inside the jungle. So at the end of almost uh, almost one year working with them, we've got uh, twelve homestays now running, where tourists can come go there and stay in this uh, destination. So this is uh, run by the Penan community, and is uh, quite uh, successful in that sense. Then we have another community in Barrio, uh, known for their your food, uh, you can see in the image there, country Idris Jala is there. So he is from that village as well. So through him, we've done some work uh, in this village in, that has adopted uh, community-based tourism very well. 
Uh, this is another community in in uh, in Anarais in Sarawak where they're known for their bamboo as the USP here, and they use that uh, extensively as a as a pool for tourists coming uh, to these uh, longhouses. And then you have this one. This is what I mentioned to you earlier: the the twenty first century village that won the award uh, in Kinabatangan Sabah. So again, using the CBT model very well. The the toolkit and then you have others if you see a lot of these products are from uh, Sabah and Sarawak this is the Intaman Negara Sarawak and then have uh, also uh, scaling up uh, the whole using uh, rural tourism concept CBT concept for uh, dairy farming so this is uh, the left image is uh, is in Sabah and then the right one is in, in Slango one of the uh, farms in Slango. And then there are products. Uh, we have done uh, workshops and training for the local community in Myanmar using the same toolkit. So this is again another village in, in, in the region, Magwe region in, in Myanmar. And then you have the Shan State in Myanmar, also rural tourism products. You can see the, the images. It's very much rural and they are pulling a lot of people together. A lot of the ethnics here are working together. This is in Kachin State in, uh, in Myanmar as well, uh, where the, the main product here is fishing. They have a big lake there and that use the USP to, to attract tourists to come. They, they rent cycle and they go around the village and enjoy staying there. You have the Kaya State in Myanmar. This is more unique on the culture itself. The community is a unique culture, become a showpiece here. The dolphin protected area in Myanmar. So this is another one uh, where dolphin was used to attract the tourists to come there. So fishing was the main, but because of tourists coming now, conservation has become as important. And then you have in the Philippines. So if you see a lot of tourists, uh, CBT program in the Philippines is very much tied to their food. Okay, they, uh, they push so much on into farm to table concept where the product from the farm straight come to the to the restaurant and then served. Sometimes tourists go to the farm, do the harvesting, they learn how to cook and then they eat the food. So that is the concept that you see a lot in the Philippines. Uh, this is in Central Philippines as well. Also focus on the food. Uh, this is a famous Guimaras uh, village in Philippines where they, uh, they have a lot of uh, cultural activities here, agri-tourism, eco-tourism, heritage tours. This is quite one of the most popular village. Uh, another one in the Philippines, uh, where the focus is on agro-tourism. This is also agro-tourism using cocoa, the Malagos farm house in the Philippines, where the pool factor is actually uh, cocoa and how they produce the cocoa, how they manage. And it's part of the CBT program as well. Then you have others in the Philippines, very much a farm to table concept. Uh, this is in, in the Caribbean. So in the Caribbean, uh, again, uh, uh, the main uh, uh, network that pulls all the countries together is through the Compete Caribbean, where they get a lot of funding from, from uh, the International Development Bank, American Development Bank, uh, from UK and also from Canada. And then the, you have a lot of development taking place in, in Guyana. This is Guyana, where they focus on the, the fish here, one of the biggest fish. Then you have in Grenada, uh, another popular destination. Although, yes, the pull factor is the cruise tourists, but when the cruise tourists come, they are taken to a rural tourism destination to actually understand the local culture. So they ride on the, the big spending tourists coming and then bring them to the village and show them the local culture. This is in Jamaica, the same thing. The focus, a lot of focus on, uh, on ecotourism. In St. Lucia, it's a lot of uh, food, food and rum festival. Uh, and then of course, in the Bahamas, I've done a lot of work because I was based there for five years. Uh, we introduced the whole concept of CBT in the Bahamas. They had the concept, but they never used the term CBT, but they use what they call uh, the, the people to people concept or P2P, where every uh, locals, can actually host somebody in their house and then sell tourism. So that is the concept. So we write on that program and then we started working on a lot of projects for the Bahamas uh, in, in the island of Bimini, a small island within the Bahamas, where we've done a lot of programs 
bringing uh, the tourist attraction, the culture, and the gastronomy. So this is just a snap, snapshot uh, from some of the work in the Bahamas. This is talking on looking at the, the, the coral reefs as a base, swimming. They have also what you call swimming with the pigs and stingrays. It's very popular in one part of the island of the Bahamas. It's become a USP because there's not many destinations in the world that you have this as well. And then uh, horseback riding, uh, musical festival, the old culture and festival, your food, the gastronomy. So, so if you look at all this product that you see here, this is something that we also have here in Malaysia. Of course, it's very different, but the same concept can actually be applied. So if you look at the research from the Caribbean, uh, showed that the following activities that can generate the most revenue for business and uh, business involving the community. So if you see the list here, there's a long list here. Uh, although, of course, this study was done in the Caribbean, similarly in Malaysia, it's almost similar. Beach tourism, eco lodge, uh, farm to table, festival, food and beverage tour, heritage site, homestays, indigenous tourism, local tourism, uh, uh, education, okay, school exchange program, cultural immersion, traditional cuisine, uh, traditional health and wellness, Voluntary with local experience, okay. Voluntary, uh, voluntary tourism is becoming very popular in Malaysia. Uh, your wellness, wildlife, so all this product that you see here can easily be uh, applied even here in Malaysia and in, in different parts of the world. So, so, if you look at rural tourism strategies in Malaysia, uh, there's already a, a review that was done uh, not too long ago uh, on the national tourism policies where six transformative strategy that has already been uh, put in place to develop uh, even community-based tourism. So if you look at the, the six uh, here, the governance side, the investment part, uh, the smart tourism, how you bring digital to the play, how do you manage the, the demands that has changed post-COVID, the expectation of travel behavior have changed, how do you manage that? How do you practice sustainability and responsibility? How do you upskill human capital? All that is already there. So this model that I have will actually go into the current tourism policies, uh, the changes that's happening in the current tourism policy with five main uh, uh, strategic action that you see here. Uh, this is again based on the national tourism policy that was recently uh, uh, developed and launched already 2020, 2030, where the focus is very much on to develop agri-tourism corridors with a specific theme based on the USP, as I've said, you must have a USP or else you cannot sell to uh, CBT. Facilitate, facilitate the setting up of mini visitor center at agriculture farms to foster growth of community-driven agritourism corridor. So the interpretation, the third one, the trails. Okay, what are the trail, gastronomic trails, encouraging lo local food to operate in rustic restaurants? You know, expecting a five-star looking uh, restaurant, okay? What we need is, uh, is, is, the, is the quality of the food and the quality of the service. The fourth one, training for local youth. The capacity building is important or else you're going to continuously have the youth leaving the village. And then the last one here is events, okay? Community-based event related to rural tourism. So these are the five things that is strategic uh, uh, areas that CBT, can also look at to actually transform. Okay, so just to conclude, um, what is important in any CBT program is transformation. Okay, your aim is to transform the community. So you want to elevate the community, you want to empower them, you want to make sure they have sufficient financial support, you want to ensure that tourism is going to give them additional income, an alternate income. Uh, you are able to develop a good model for local entrepreneurship, okay? Making sure the youths can actually develop themselves. So these are all important uh, for the long-term success of any rural uh, tourism uh, destination. So without uh, a proper guidance, without having all this step-by-step -step approach, without having uh, this hand-holding session, you will have a problem in sustaining. You can develop, but it will not sustain. 
Okay, so linkages, as I've said, as important. Build the linkages around you. So we are fortunate because in Southeast Asia, community-based tourism is doing well. So there's a lot of linkages in Thailand and Cambodia that you can learn from. Remember, I talked to you about community to community uh, training. This is important. Go and see your neighboring country and learn from them. What can we do? Okay, so there's a lot of po positive benefit that we also talked about uh, in terms of uh, 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 conservation, maintaining the, the youth at the village itself, giving the quality experience. So all these things has become as important. So remember, the session today, I know it's a lot I've given you, uh, but it's giving you a big picture, step by step, what can you do with your community? Uh, there are toolkits to help you. You need some help. As I've said, I'm always here to help. If you need any assistance, contact me. Or a regional collaboration and network across Malaysia and outside Malaysia, where there's a public and private uh, partnership can be met and, and help the, the village accordingly. So at the end of the day, uh, CBT, as I've said at the beginning, also help you to move closer to your sustainable development goal and also your own Malaysia's own uh, national development plan. So this is important. So at the end of the day, you want to fulfill the, the requirement of what is set in the national development plan and also ensure that you support your sustainable development goal. Okay, so I've spoke long for the last one and a half hours. And uh, I know there's a lot of information, uh, maybe it's information overload, but uh, as I've said, my main goal today is for you to get a, a big picture of what uh, CBT is all about and how you can uh, uh, ensure that uh, you are able to guide your community. So maybe a lot of things that I spoke to you about here is good for, uh, for those who are involved in developmental work to help community. It can even be local community who is able to to move or carry themselves to the next level. So at the end of the day, uh, our main goal is to build local entrepreneurship to ensure that you are giving the empowerment to the local community. All right, so, so that's all for my session. And let me now look at, uh, open for any questions. Uh, Okay, there's not question on the chat box, but if there's anyone has any comments or feedback or questions, feel free to uh, un unmute yourself and also uh, ask me uh, any question. I see one question here. Some of NGOs use CBT methodology to encourage and empower local to conserve birds in local site. Yes, exactly. So as I've said, the partnership with NGO is good if you get the right uh, partners. Not just Fraser Seal, uh, a lot of this also happening now in, in Sabah, in Kota Kinabalu. I, I see a lot more appreciation of birds happening now. So they use tourism to actually conserve the bird and also to teach people. They do bird watching. And then you see uh, tourists from all over the world just coming on certain season to see certain methods. So the C CBT methodology can actually be used uh, to, en to empower the locals and to, to, to support their local development of their product. Uh, so there, as I've said at the beginning, uh, the nine step that I showed you is not cast in stone. You can change it accordingly, but what is important is the pointers that I put there, what you need to take into consideration when you are developing community-based tourism. Okay, any question from anybody? Okay, there's one question here. Does guides or local needs to be licensed from Ministry of uh, Tourism? So under Ministry of Tourism, there are a lot of licensing, okay? Uh, so a tour guide, uh, there's the licensing if you're nature-based, if you're a city guide, then the change accordingly. So, uh, uh, so there are licensing mechanism that is put in place by the Ministry of Tourism. So you got to see, are you licensed for what kind of uh, guiding. Uh, so you can take up everything, but there are specific license. Uh, if you're doing city tour versus a nature-based tour, eco-tour is, is quite different. 
So best to get the correct guide uh, that are licensed in order for you to use them to actually uh, promote to the tourists. I know any program or grant for CBT field. Uh, I think CBT field, there are grants from the government, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, developmental agency. I, I see a lot from, uh, especially in NCR, who's here today, Northern Corridor, where there are grants on capacity building, uh, on trying to help the local community to develop themselves through tourism, because tourism is another important component, not just in NCR, in many parts of Malaysia. So within the developmental grant, uh, there are opportunities for you to actually approach these agencies to see whether you are able to apply on this grant. But at the end of the day, remember uh, one of the pointers that I may mention, uh, don't fall on this handout trap or subsidy trap where you say, okay, without the grant, I cannot do anything or you over rely on the grant because if you over rely on the grant, again, if you do not use that to jumpstart to succeed your business, then you will fall down. So that's why the cooperative model becomes important. The grant is a good start, uh, but at the end of the day, you have to be self-sufficient. That is what we want. Okay. Uh, any question? We still have time. One of the challenges, okay, I see another question. One of the challenges I face when running a small hotel in a rural area is that hiring of the locals, yeah. We pledge to hire people from the local kampong, but I do encounter uh, the most of the time they do not have the drive discipline that is required to the job and end up not wanting to work. I still would like to help the community. How can I tackle this issue or motivate them? Yes, okay, this is not a unique problem. Uh, in, in Malaysia as well. Uh, as I've said, uh, I just came back after five years uh, in, in the Bahamas. So uh, one of the big problems we faced, I did a project in one of the islands. Uh, no, this island is uh, going to attract a lot of tourists because uh, one of the cruise liner, uh, Virgin Voyages under Sir Richard Branson, uh, is actually going to go to this one particular island and that cruise carries about two to 3,000 visitors. So now, so I've been assigned to work with the local community to prepare them because it's a rural destination. How can the community ensure authentic product being sold and, and you have these tourists coming in? Um, so the challenge was, as what you put in here, so one of the requirement was to ensure that local community is hired to do this work and not fly in someone from outside to manage. At the end of the day, the last thing you want is uh, a group of tourists coming to an, a, a remote island and the workers in this remote island are all foreigners. That's the last thing you need. So again, the same problem. So there's no shortcut. Of course, the, the capacity building has become important. The locals has to know that uh, the income that you make uh, eventually is going to be good. A lot of them are not motivated because they see in the past, they say, oh, okay, my parents was involved and they're still doing that. They're not earning much. They're still living in poverty. So they have this mindset that, oh, it's not, it's not for me. I want to leave. I want to leave. So when the moment you start pushing them in, they're not going to work well unless there are new things that is coming in. There's new way innovation. Technology is coming in and you bring creativity into uh, tourism then it may work. So hiring, uh, when you pledge, most companies, uh, yes, one of the requirements uh, for those companies from outside coming to help is you must pledge to help the local community. So the first step, remember I told you, uh, readiness. So when you first approach this village, that step is important to get the buy-in. If there is no buy-in from the local kampong in the first place, that you just went in, to set up something is going to fail. So the local buy-in is important. So don't go in if there is no local buy-in. So the, the Ketua Kampung, the local champion, uh, and then how influence are they? Because sometimes you do have local champion who are as useless. So they call themselves local champion, but they're not. Then again, it fails. So you need to make sure you have the right people that you communicate with. 
before you can get into the program or else uh, the program will fail. As you put there, uh, they're not motivated, they're not disciplined enough, they don't have the skill as well, they don't have any motivation to work, then it's going to fail. Uh, but there are others outside who wants to come in. So, but then when you bring outside, then it, it, it creates other problems within the community. Uh, and you see that even in another island that I worked with in Samporna, in uh, uh, Mabul, in uh, this island to Sipadan Island. <clears throat> when they shut down Sipadan, uh, everyone had to stay in Mabul. So the tourists started coming and staying there. The local community became unhappy. They were not hired to main of the job, uh, main of the main job. And you had the, the people from outside the island started getting employed. So that created problem within the community. Is there an association NGO group in Malaysia that you prefer to join? Um, thank you, Sherry. ASEAN CBT community, never know about that before. Oh, there are a few actually. The ASEAN one is one. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's a lot in Thailand, Thailand in, and also in, in Cambodia. Uh, in Malaysia, of course, uh, <laughs> through the Malaysian, where I'm also involved, the Malaysian Ecotourism Association, they do a lot of work with CBT. Uh, I talked to you about earlier at the beginning on Professor Amran Hamza, where I work a lot of my program, CBT program with him. He's also part of this uh, Malaysian Ecotourism Association. Uh, so there are a lot of this network within uh, Southeast Asia. In Malaysia, maybe it's not as strong. There's a lot of silos, everyone like working very independently. Uh, so that's another problem in Malaysia as well. A lot of silos, people are working separately and not jointly, um, which is something that uh, I think the Ministry of Tourism got to tackle on. How do you bring everyone together under one umbrella? Okay. Um, anyone else? So the, uh, I think you have uh, our administrator, Razi have put up the uh, form there, survey for attendance and survey form. So I hope you will pick it up, click and and uh, submit your input. Razia, have we done the photo, photo shoot? If it's not done, I can still do it uh, because one of the requirements of this training under HRDC uh, is uh, to snap your attendance as well. So maybe like, if she has done, it's fine, but if she has not, I can still do it again. Maybe before we end, can we all maybe on our camera, one snapshot? One Malu to open your camera. I see Datin Shadi, you're here today. I don't know whether you have any comments or question that you want to shoot. Yeah, it's very, very good talk, uh, Dr. Vic, just that I was able to join the uh, part, part of it. Okay. Yeah, but I, I hope, I don't know whether it will be, whether the session will be available after. Yes, after this, this is. Uh, yeah, the session is recorded, so we can. Okay. Uh, we can. Yeah, uh, good. Thank we, you. We can so I can catch up. Can, yeah, sure. Very, very insightful, uh, Jerry. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, whoever is with the cameras on, I see some your videos are not active, so it's fine. Okay, let me step. First one. Okay, done. So once again, uh, thank you. Thank you for staying until the end. Uh, as I've said, you've, you've got my email. So if you need further session, if you think you want to run a more thorough workshop on, on some of the things that I've said, uh, I'll be happy to do it. Uh, I know the session was a bit too much uh, because uh, we are trying to cover a lot. I want to really give a good snapshot uh, 
for those who are keen on this area. Hence, I had to put a lot of things there. Uh, so if you think you need to communicate with me, please feel free to write to me and uh, I'll be glad to find ways to, to work with you. Prof, okay. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Would, would you be able to do um, one special one just, just for organization like INCR? Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, if there are anyone interested, uh, any organization uh, is interested to have a specific session or maybe you've already identified a particular village that you want to develop your CBT and, and then you want a, a hand-holding session using this toolkit to develop them as a case, then you can. Uh, we, I'll be happy to, to work with NCR or, or any other organization as well. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll see you again for all, any other sessions and uh, that's, more that's sessions. One, that's one more question, yes. I think. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, from your experience, does a successful CBT need to be grouped in a consortium or is it, uh, or it is from their own initiative to discuss among themselves? Well, uh, it's, the challenge with the consortium is sometimes uh, you have, uh, you may not get the buy-in of everyone. So it is always good to start uh, to discuss. Uh, my, my approach has always been look at the, the community by itself alone first, and then you start working community by community. And then you form the community that has similar thoughts into a consortium. If you just lump them all together in a consortium, then you will see, oh, this village is doing well. This village is not doing well. The tourists are all going here. You see a rivalry happening among the community. And I've seen that uh, in, in, in Sabah and in Sarawak, where a community that was peaceful now is having problem. So we knew that there's a problem in the model. The model have uh, increased their their financial standing, but at the same time, it has created other problems. So it becomes a problem. So, so my own approach will be actually to approach, uh, to, to initiate discussion separately with them before you even form this consortium with the, the like-minded group that has the same uh, understanding or the same vision or expectation. Okay, if there's no more question, time is 2.17 now. Thank you so much. We will stay in touch for a few. We'll have more sessions coming out of uh, District College as well on this area. Uh, some of this training is going to be registered under HRDC as a, as a training. Uh, so it'll be a full-fledged training coming up soon as well. All right, thank you so much.